Thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here in Russia with so many friends and colleagues. So you invite me to talk about two topics. The first one is going to be invasive candidiasis. The second one later on about bacterial infection. So now it's time to talk about candida. And I started talking about candida. These are my disclosure, even regarding a two-day presentation. But let's talk about how many of the sepsis in the ICU are related to candida. So these are quite uh, old data, but you know, they put together patients from the ICU from all over the world. This is the EPIC2 study specifically designed for ICU, where they include more than around 200 European ICU with more than 3,000 patients. And you can see that when I analyze specifically the etiology of sepsis, after Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas, third in the rank was Candida. So Candida, at least from this experience, show to be very frequent. What about uh, other data? So these are data from United States. I don't want to talk about you, Amer uh, America, but uh, I pick up two very similar studies run in two different periods. The first one was run at the end of the 90s. And the second one was run very recently in 2014, published in two very important journals, one in Clinical Infectious Disease and the other in New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see similar studies, more or less 10, 15 years difference in terms of time. In the first study, the role of Canada in bloodstream infections, specifically in the ICU, was 10%. In the second period, the role of Canada was 22%. So there was a dramatic increase in the role of Canada. Is this number correct? Probably this is an overestimation of the role of Canada. But in general, Canada is a growing problem in ICU, particularly for ICU patients. Another important problem for the patients in the ICU, and not only for the patients in ICU, is represented by abdominal candidiasis. So this is a kind of new entity. And when you talk about abdominal candidiasis, we mainly refer to peritonitis. 30 to 40% are secondary and tertiary peritonitis. Then we have abscesses, pancreatitis, and infection of the biliary tract. So we recently report in 2015 a very a big number of uh, abdominal candidiasis, around 500 cases, and we report a very high mortality, around 27% of mortality for this type of infection. But why candida are important? For one very important point for clinicians, when we talk about susceptibility to fluconazole, in general, in candida peritonitis, there is a reduced susceptibility to fluco. You can see very well from this study from Philippe Montraver from Paris area, in which they analyzed the susceptibility profile of the different type of candida. Susceptibility for fluconazole was reduced when the infections originate from the abdominal tract. 9% resistant in albicans, 64 in glabrata, and you know very well the all the species of cruzii are resistant to fluco. So be careful because when you have a, a, an, a, an infection originate from the abdominal tract, you have a higher risk to have uh, uh, resistance to fluconazole. So another important point for an uh, ICU doctor, for clinicians, is how many of the candidemia or invasive candidiasis episode present septic shock. So in general, we have more septic shock when we have abdominal cases. Look, these are the data. Between 35 to 50% of all the episodes of abdominal candidiasis present septic shock, while we have only, I don't want to say only, but you know, lower proportion of patients with candidemia present septic shock. So in general, abdominal candidiasis are, the patient with abdominal candidiasis are sicker compared to the patient with candidemia. Another important consideration for clinicians is the clinical presentation of fungal sepsis is different by the presentation of bacterial sepsis. So can we differentiate a candidal sepsis from a bacterial sepsis? In a prospective randomizable brine, uh, multi-centered uh, comparing trial, uh, 
publishing 20 or 2 in, clinic, in critical care medicine, they show no big differences between candida and bacterial uh, sepsis. However, there were higher levels of lactate in patients with bacterial septic shock and higher incidence of renal hepatic failure in patients with candida septic shock. But one important point that I'd like to discuss with you was discussed uh, by the previous speaker, what is the role of procalcitonin in septic shock related to candida? So in general, based on this experience from Sicilia, from Italy, published in 2014, the level of PCT, of procalcitonin, were lower in patients present candidemia. You can see here the level of PCT in candidemia compared to the level of PCT in bacteremia or even in mixed infection. So if you have a patient that presents the classical risk factors colonized with candida, in septic shock with low level of PCT, probably this is one adjunctive tool to suspect uh, a case of uh, candidemia. So what we know about candida in terms of management of candida? So what do we have to do uh, for the cases of abdominal candidiasis or uh, uh, candidemia? So it's really important to have an adequate and appropriate management. So this is a study that I ran in, uh, in Italy and in Spain and published in 2014, in which we analyzed uh, uh, in a retrospective way, patients with bloodstream infections related to candida from five hospitals from Spain and Italy. And at the end, we have 216 episodes of candidemia with septic shock. And you know the data? If you have a patient with septic shock, in order to improve the survival rate, you have to give to your patient an adequate antifungal therapy, but at the same time, an adequate source control. This is a key. Very important. If you have a patient with a, a candidemia related to the catheter, you have to remove the catheter, the central venous catheter, as soon as possible. If you have a patient with an abdominal case, you have to send the patient to the operating theater as soon as possible. This is regarding candidemia, and this is the experience about abdominal cases. Again, experience published in Intensive Care Medicine 2015. You can see we split the patients in two categories, patients with septic shock and patients without septic shock. Look, in the patient with septic shock here, look, if you do an adequate source control, this is the difference between adequate antifungal and no adequate antifungal. You can see very well, mortality was 25 for an adequate antifungal and was uh, more around 50 if you don't use an adequate antifungal. But look, if you don't do an adequate source control, Look at the mortality, 60 versus 65. So the message is that if you don't do one of the gray source control, it's impossible to change the mortality or the survival of your patients, even if you use the best antifungal you have. Very important. Source control is a key for candida infection. So talking about candida in general in the ICU specifically, we know that in general, candida present a very high mortality. So these are the data from DenCat in which they analyze the ICU mortality. And you can see very well that when the mortality for candida has been compared with the mortality for other type of infections, every time the mortality for candida was higher. Why? The patients died for candida or with candida? We never know. But candida in general, in the blood cultures, is considered a bad marker. We don't know if the patient died with or for, but in any case, having candida in the blood is a really bad marker, and, and we have to do something in order to reduce this mortality. So in general, what are the typical risk factors for developing a, an invasive candidiasis? There are several risk factors for candida. And in general, candida is the classical problem of the modern medicine. More risk factors mean more interventions. And when we look at the classical risk factors for candida, there are all 
the typical risk factors of the modern medicine. We have decolonization, and usually you have decolonization when you stay in a hospital longer. There are comorbidities. Patients with a lot of comorbidities are patients at risk for candida. And then we have the surgical interventions and the non-surgical interventions. Typically, the non-surgical interventions are central venous catheter, multiple transfusions, vascular catheters, broad-spectrum antibiotics. But then we have also the surgical one, like the recent surgery, the disruption of the physiological barriers of the digestive tract, the major abdominal surgery. So you can see that in order to stratify patient at risk for candida, is a really complex situation in which you have to put together several different risk factors. What we know about the relationship between the time of the treatment and the mortality, we know very well, based on this very well-known experience published by Morrell in 2005, that in order to reduce the mortality to an acceptable level, like between 10 to 15 percent, we have to start the treatment within 12 hours after the beginning of the septic shock. Because you can see very well here that if you start the treatment after 24 or 48 hours, the mortality reach very high levels. So the key is try to treat our patients as soon as possible. Within 24 hours is the key for uh, uh, our uh, uh, algorithm, our pathway for these patients. So based on that, I know, we know very well that for patients that present suspect uh, uh, um, fungal infections, every minute count. So it's really important. The time of the treatment is an important point. So giving you an example, how can we treat patients with invasive candidiasis appropriately and on time. I give you an example. This is a very nice experience from the group of Marin Kurloff from the United States, in which they try to analyze the effect of empiric antifungal therapy uh, for patients with septic shock, and they analyze the time to appropriate therapy for candida. So they split two periods. The first period was in 2012, in which they include an antifungal therapy based on the discretion of the physician. I decide to prescribe or not to prescribe an antifungal. In the second period, 2013, every patient with septic shock receive an antifungal and uh, receive high-dose fluconazole or anekinocandy. And the data are quite impressive. You know why? Because, you know, when you look at the, the time to adequate therapy, you can see that the patient that receive empiric therapy receive an adequate therapy within four hours. And when we look at the more important, the appropriate within 12 hours and the appropriate within 24 hours, that is our goal, the patient that receive empiric therapy present 70% and 76 an adequate therapy within 24 hours. So the message from this study was, please use empiric therapy. But we know that we cannot use empiric therapy for all the patient in septic shock. Otherwise, we do an over-treatment. So we prescribe probably more drugs than the patient need. So do we have adjunctive tools for the diagnosis of candida? So in general, the microbiology laboratories are able to help us? Unfortunately, no. Why? Because the time to to, for the from the collection to blood culture positivity is too long. You can see here, if you send the blood culture to the lab and you wait for the result of the blood culture, look, the median time was 32 hours, but we, we, there are patients that present positive blood cultures after 100 hours, four days, too much. We cannot wait the result of the blood cultures. And how we can do without the blood cultures. So actually, we have new tests, the so-called non-culture test for candida. There are several new tests, and this is a recent review that I published a couple of months ago in Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy about all of these type of tests 
And you can see here beta D glucan. So beta D glucan is a very good test. It's not a perfect test, but give us the possibility to have a very high negative predictive value. So if you suspect candida infections based on these factors, you can start an antifungal, send the beta D glucan to the lab. If the beta D glucan is negative, you can stop and rule out infections. If the beta D glucan is positive, you can continue your treatment. So this is just a, 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 an advice. Then what else? The CACTA or the T2 that are tests that will be available in the future and probably will be able to help us to do more diagnosis. So these are the non-cultured tests. But I know that uh, uh, these tests are not uh, uh, everywhere available. So talking about the different possibility for the treatment of candida, how many strategies do we have? How many strategies we can use in ICU? So we know that we can use the prophylaxis that is more or less given antifungal just based on the risk factors. And this is a kind of strategy that pro personally I discourage to use because if you use the prophylaxis, typically with fluconazole, you overtreat your patients and you select a resistant problem. Then we have the empirical therapy. And the empirical therapy is more or less fever-driven approach. I decide to prescribe an antifungal because my patient has fever despite broad spectrum antibiotics. And then we have the preemptive approach. And the preemptive is something in between the prophylaxis, the empirical, and the proven therapy. Means you have a patient that presents risk factors, clinical science, yes or no, but biomarkers, beta D glucan, PCT, colonization. So this is something, in my opinion, that is probably more close to the proven therapy than to the uh, uh, empirical use. So to give you one example, is the empirical approach the best approach we can use in the ICU? So the fever-driven approach is the best approach? Unfortunately, this is our experience from Roma, Pisa, and Udine. We collect 340 cases of candidemia and we publish in American Journal of Medicine 2016. And we analyze how many of the patients with candidemia present fever. And you know, 50% of the patients with candidemia doesn't present fever. So if you go and you follow the fever, you lose a lot of patients with candidemia. And a lot of them present septic shock. Look, 44 and 41. So don't follow the fever. If you follow the fever, you lose too many patients with candida. So there are a lot of infections like candida, but also many others without fever. So for this reason, my idea is that it's probably better to move from the empirical approach, that is the fever-driven approach, to the preemptive approach based on predictive rules and biomarkers. What we know about the risk predictive models for invasive candidiasis. So in general, we know that there are several risk predictive models. So this is a very well-known one called the Candida score or the Leon score that is based on numbers. You know, every single risk factor count for one or two. Like if you have a patient with surgery, total parental nutrition, cerebral sepsis, and candida colonization, you have five. This means that you have a very high risk to have candida. So use whatever you want. You can use the Ostrowski, the candida, the colonization, the short, the Dupont, Michalopoulos. But in general, it's important, in my opinion, to stratify the patients for the risk of candida with one of these risk predictive models. So, these risk predict models were able to help us in selecting the appropriate therapy. So I give you two examples. So this is the first one published by Ostrowski Zeckner in 2014. So this was a randomized double-blind placebo controlled trial of caspofungin prophylaxis and echinocandin for invasive candidates in high-risk adult patients in the ICU. So these patients were stratified to receive caspofungin 
or a placebo in a patient in the ICU with ventilate and antibiotic and with one of the classical risk factor, like parental nutrition, dialysis, surgery, pancreatitis, uterine steroid, and immunosuppressive agents. And you know, the data were not so good. Why were not so good? Because when we look at the incidence of proven or probably invasive candidiasis, you can see using an echinocannin or using a placebo didn't show any statistically significant difference. However, when we look particularly in patients with the preemptive approach, based on the use of the beta d glucan using caspofungin or another echinocannin, but this was caspofungin, was able to reduce the number of fungal infections. So the message from this study was, if you combine risk factors plus biomarkers, probably you can capture more cases. And the second experience that is the, called the Empiricus trial that was published last year by Jean-François Timsit in JAMA, in which they use another echinocan, micafungin, comparing to placebo. Again, look, the primary endpoint was the survival at day 28, and they, were, they, they didn't see any difference between uh, micafungin and the placebo. However, when they look at the new invasive fungal infections, using the micafungin was able to reduce the total number of fungal infections. So in some manner, there was a benefit. In another side, no benefit in terms of mortality. So based on this experience, these are my personal criteria that I published in 2016 in, uh, in Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy to start the preemptive antifungal therapy. And these are my criteria. First of all, patients in the hospital or in the ICU for more than seven days, because in general, uh, the uh, fungal infections are very uncommon in the first days of hospitalization. Plus, antibiotics in the previous seven days or a central venous catheter. Plus, two, two not one, of the following risk factors, total parental nutrition, dialysis, merger surgery, pancreatitis, use of steroids, and immunosuppressive agents. It's not enough, in my opinion, to start an antifungal. You need something more, and something more is this one is probably the candida colonization, at least in one side, a positive beta d glucan, and or very low or not significant level of PCT. In this situation, my suggestion is to start an antifungal. And then what to do? If you send the beta d glucan to the lab and the beta d glucan is negative, you can discontinue the antifungal treatment because of the very high negative predictive value. Very important this point. Start based on the uh, instability of the patient and then stop based on the biomarker. If the biomarker are positive, you can continue. If not, you can stop. So the, the, the second most important point is which antifungal? So this is the more or less the strategy for the treatment of uh, uh, patient with invasive candidiasis. Which antifungal? So all the guidelines actually recommend as the first line drugs, the echinocandins. You can see very well, echinocandins are the preferred choice for American guidelines, European guidelines, uh, 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 in International Society of Chemotherapy guidelines. But why the echinocandins are the recommended drug? For several reasons. First of all, because they present broad spectrum of activity. Then, because the resistance to echinocannins is very uncommon, very rare. They have a very good biofilm activity, fungicidal, good safety profile, and fewer drug drug interactions, and at least one echinocannin, anidulafungin, demonstrate to be superior to fluconazole in one randomized clinical trial. So looking at the difference in terms of mortality, so this is a nice experience published by David Anders in 2012, in which they analyze in the patient level quantitative review of randomized trials, difference in mortality between echinocannins and other antifungal agents. And you can see reduced mortality for echinocannins when it has been compared to the other options. And when we look particularly at patients with septic shock, so typically the patients in the ICU, 
This study by Marian Kolev ran specifically in patients with the candidemia and septic shock. You can see that the only class of antibiotics able to reduce the mortality were the chinocandids. No fluco, no amphotericin B, no voriconazole. So only echinocandins were able to reduce the overall mortality. Then the point is, who's the best? So we know that we have three echinocandins. I'm not here to discuss about soccer because you know that the Italians in uh, this year are not so happy about soccer, especially because we don't come to Russia for the World Cup. But you know, there are uh, players, no one Italians, okay? But you know, I'm not here to discuss about soccer, but here about who's the best. Who's the best echinocandin? I don't know. But we know that there are some differences between the echinocandins. The most important difference is the pharmacological difference, the PKPD properties. So we know that caspomic and adula fungin present a di different metabolism. Caspofungin is uh, degradated spontaneously with some uh, hydrolysis and acetylization. Micafungin presents an hepatic metabolism and anidolafungin is not metabolized and uh, we have a, a bile elimination after slow chemical degradation. So this means that not metabolized means less problems, less interaction, more to tolerability. And in fact, when we look at the different situation that you have in the ICU, like aumented renal clearance, uh, ACI, uh, that is acute kin injury, the renal replacement therapy, and also the acute renal failure, the only one that doesn't have any change is represented by anidula and mica. So they present, they are more manageable compared to all the other classes. And anidula fungi in particular, as, as I told you before, show a superiority over fluconazole in the treatment of patients with the candida. You can see a very well, a really important superiority of anidula fungi compared to candida. So what can I say in summary about the echinocandin? So in general, they present similar broad spectrum fungicidal anti antibiofilm activity, similar to anidula, caspo, and uh, mica. But there are some differences in a pharmacokinetic profile. Probably anidula fungin and mica fungin are better. In particular, anidula fungin as a higher volume of distribution and short half-life, and anidula fungi that, not, that does not require any adjustment for patients with renal or hepatic impairment. They have a very similar safety profile, but they are low potential for drug interaction, specifically for anidula and for mica, and for invasive candidiasis and, and candidemia, we have strong data for all the echinocandines, and recently, anidula fungin has been approved for the use in neutropenic patients. So this is more or less my idea about the echinocandines. So the last point that I'd like to discuss with you before the end is, do we have to treat for the total duration of the treatment with echinocandines? So two weeks with echinocandines? Absolutely no. So we start echinocandine when the patient is unstable, and then we can de-escalate to fluconazole or to another option, to voriconazole, if resistant. Why? Because it's important not to put too much pressure on the echinocandine. So, but when can we de-escalate from an echinocandine to another option? So de-escalation from an echinocandine to intravenous or fluconazole should be encouraged when the patient is clinically stable and the isolate strain is susceptible to fluco. However, the exact timing for shifting to flucol is basically unknown and may vary from one patient to another. We have patient that is stable after three days and we can de-escalate after three days. There is another patient that is stable after seven or there is a patient that is never stable and is probably good to continue with Anti, uh, with the echinocandines for the total duration. Do we have data to support this strategy? So this is a very nice experience from the French, Sebastien Bailly, in which they analyze patients that de-escalate with the patient that doesn't de-escalate with, uh, 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 with the candidal infections. And you can see de-escalation strategy within five days had no 
significant impact on the 28 days mortality. And at the end, look how much money they save in the de-escalation, more or less 1,000 euros. So my suggestion is that good to start with the kinocannins, then patient stable, de-escalate to fluco or to voriconazole. So this is my last slide, and this is more or less my personal receipt that I publish uh, in intensive care medicine about the stewardship approach for antifungals specifically in the ICU. And I tried put, to put together the 10 most remarkable rules. First of all, please restrict or avoid antifungal prophylaxis. Second point, differentiate infection from colonization. Don't treat patient with candida in the respiratory tract. Candida pneumoniae doesn't exist. Don't treat candida in the lung. Third point, use non-culture-based diagnostic for early detection of candida, like the beta diglucan. Limit the use of empirical therapy based only on risk factors and move from the empirical to the early preemptive based on risk factors plus biomarkers. Get treatment right the first time with adequate drugs, echinocandins. Then have adequate source control within 48 hours. Remove the catheter or appropriate drainage of surgical control. Use an adequate dose. Low dose is associated with resistance. De-escalate whenever possible within day five. And 10 rule, stop early useless therapy and check duration of the therapy. This is more or less my receipt. I know that uh, there are many of you that already did a lot of uh, photos, but if you want to have the presentation, please register to this website. It's free of charge, www.htide.net. And in this way, you can eventually participate in a meeting that I organize in Venezia at the end of the year, October 25 and 26. Thank you very much for your attention.